Hello and welcome to what I would say is probably the most important electric car to wear the three-pointed star on it so far. What is it? Well, of course, it is the EQS from Mercedes EQ. And why do I think it's so important? Well, it's that last letter in the name, S, because this car exists to be the flagship, the top of the tree, the pinnacle of what the fully electric range from Mercedes EQ can do. And we've got to find out, is that last letter in the name supposed to be there? Is it worthy of being called an S, electric or otherwise? Well, to find out, we're going to live with the car. We're going to put it through a few tests, find out all about it, get under its skin and see just how good it is and how close to that all-important S-Class it can be. So if you want to find out more about the rest of the range from Mercedes EQ, from Mercedes-Benz, and of course from Smart, make sure to check out the rest of the videos on our channel. Make sure to subscribe to us as well so that you don't miss a thing. But without any further ado, let's get into it. Let's get living with an EQS. No, not really. The proportions are totally different. And because the batteries are mounted between the wheels, that means that there are super short overhangs at the front and the rear, and this gives even more room for the roof line to just gently arc from front to rear. Now, I've been itching to see this car in the flesh. I was definitely interested, you could say, when I saw the first photo of a heavily camouflaged prototype of one of these appearing in a magazine a few years ago. And then of course, there was the concept. So there's a few concept cars that have caught my imagination over the last few years, things like the Audi R8 V12 TDI Le Mans, Jaguar CX-75, Polestar Preset, Renault Desir, and of course, the Vision EQS that previewed this car. I do think a fair few elements from the concept translated into the production version. It's always something I love to see. I would say the the camera doesn't quite do it justice. You've got to see it in person. And I personally think it looks a little bit better in a lighter color. It looks fantastic in silver. If you've seen my videos on the EQ range so far, then you'll know that I love a light bar, especially when there's a full width one at the rear and a full width one at the front. Doesn't have a light bar. Hey, what do you mean it doesn't have a light bar? Hold on, pass me the spec sheet. Thank you. Ah. Okay, so it turns out that this is a entry-level EQS. It's uh, an AMG line, not an AMG line premium. So it just has LED high-performance headlights rather than digital light with the all-important light bar. But even being an entry-level version, it does have quite a lot of things on it, such as rear axle steering, reversing camera, 20-inch AMG wheels that I'm sure I'll learn to love the style of one day, a panoramic glass sunroof, widescreen cockpit, a fingerprint scanner, hard disk navigation, and perhaps most importantly, multicolor ambient lighting and keyless entry with pop-out door handles. Where was I? Ah oh, yes. So, does it look like an S-Class? Well, I would say in its proportions, no, but in its presence, I would say the S-Class is elegantly imposing, but this looks, I would say, elegantly otherworldly. Oh, it's nice in here. It is very, very nice. When you close the door, it's like putting on a pair of noise cancelling headphones. That is how isolated you are from the outside world in here. When I first drove the car, actually, the loudest part of my journey was a V6 powered Saab accelerating past me. Things fall quite easily to hand. Everything is well within easy reach. Everything is mounted quite high up, I would say, and there's good amounts of adjustment for the seats, which are done by these capacitive touch buttons on the doors. Kind of wish the steering wheel would go a little bit lower, but that's just my weird driving position asking for that. And up in the high mounted center console, there's a pretty large storage area here and pushing this piece of trim away shows off a wireless charging pad for devices and a removable cup holder as well, actually. There's two USB-C ports in the front, plus a couple more down here in this lower storage area. Good for holding a meal deal, although I think some roller doors on that to stop things from flying around would maybe be a good job for the facelift. In terms of the design, though, I just think it looks great. Everything seems pretty 
sculpted and almost organic in its form. Apart from the illuminated turbine vents, of course, they look like they've been taken straight off the fan of a Rolls-Royce Trent XWB engine. They look great with the illumination and they make a very satisfying click when you turn them on or off. That aside though, just when you're inside the car, pick a piece of trim, pick a element and just follow it around the cabin. This gold piece of trim just starts next to me on the driver's side, flows all the way across the dash and ends up on the passenger door. It really does seem like every surface in here is an A surface. The seats that I'm sitting on as well, they're more comfortable than you might think just by taking a quick glance at their slim frame. They're a good mixture of comfortable and supportive and they hold you in place quite nicely as well. They are, of course, heated and electrically adjustable with memory. That is a standard feature for all UK-bound EQS models. The tech in front of us, that's something that we'll come back to later on in the video, but of course, there is more to the cabin than just the front row. Yeah, I've got plenty of room in here. I think there's enough room to walk an alpaca in the back of this car, to be honest. Armrests are positioned quite well. This one, of course, folds out from the central seat and also contains a pop-out cup holder that I've actually managed to get to work for the first time on camera, I believe. Hmm. There's enough room to stretch out even behind my own driving position, which is, of course, encroaching into the back of the cabin. Now, what you will notice is the floor is a little bit higher than you may expect it to be. This is, of course, because of the battery under the floor. And the floor itself isn't completely flat, owing to some of the high-voltage cables for the battery running right down the centre of it. This means for taller passengers, your knees may be a little bit higher than you would expect. Plus, headroom isn't the most expansive owing to the roof starting to slope down towards the boot about here, I think. But there are cutouts for it, and it's not like my head is actually touching the roof lining itself. A good highlight for me, definitely, pillows on the rear headrests. Very nice. The two outer rear seats are heated as standard and controlled by this button on the door card. For the ultimate in rear passenger luxury, select the luxury lounge package on exclusive luxury models, and that brings electrically adjustable memory seats to the rear, which are both heated and ventilated, and adds the MBUX rear tablet in the central armrest. For the most part, yes. Now, with this one being an EQS 450+, Plus, it's certainly brisk rather than quick. But a big highlight for me is the motor at the rear that puts out 333 horsepower and 568 newton meters of torque. It doesn't really feel like your typical electric motor. It's very linear and very progressive in the way that it delivers all of that performance. It feels like a very big diesel engine, actually. It's a good thing. Personally, I tend to prefer EVs that have a motor on each axle. I wouldn't mind a little bit more power from this one, but a little bit more regen performance wouldn't go amiss either. There are a few different stages of energy recovery that you can select using the lovely paddles that are behind the steering wheel. These go between D+, for coasting, the standard D mode for, well, standard regen level, or D- minus for strong regen, let's say. In the absence of the D auto regen mode that I tend to favor, I think it's because this one doesn't have the driving assistance package plus that comes on AMG line premium models and above. I've just been driving it in D plus and using my feet to control the braking. One thing that will take a little bit of getting used to though is how the brake pedal moves when you put it in D minus. So if I do that now, the brake pedal shoots down in the footwell so it doesn't leave you much room for if you need to apply a little bit more braking. I won't lie I'm not the biggest fan of that but as long as you know that it will do that I guess you can prepare for it. Unlike the UK bound S-Class the EQS actually gets rear axle steering as standard I think that is a great feature. The rear wheels can turn up to four and a half degrees so at lower speeds that can reduce your turning circle and make the car more agile and at higher speeds, the rear wheels will turn in the same direction as the front wheels, so it makes for really stable lane changing. All in all, it's a car that hides its size really well, and yes, whilst it is most at home at high speeds on the trunk routes, that's not to say that it is totally out of place on a back road. We'll come back to that later, I'm sure. 
The agility from all wheel steering makes it very easy to thread down narrower streets. And of course, getting in and out of parking spaces, having the turning circle of an A-Class is a huge plus for a car like this. Visibility is good out of the windscreen, although you can't see any of the bonnet really. The side windows are big, the side mirrors are huge and they have blind spot assist as standard, a very helpful feature I think as well. You can't see too much out of the rear window, but I guess that makes being tailgated by things a little bit more of a relaxing experience. Where the car really is in its element though is on motorways, on dual carriageways up at higher speeds. If anything, I would say it actually rides slightly better than the S-Class on higher speed roads. There's less sort of pitching that you get in an S-Class at this sort of speed. And perhaps strangely, I would say it's actually best when you put it in sport mode. It just firms it up a little bit, lowers the car, it feels a little bit more planted, a touch more composed, I would say. So does it drive like an S-Class? Well, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I would say it certainly feels like a relative of the model, though. Yes, promise I won't mention it again, or at least I'll try, but things are about to get very different now anyway. This is a Cadbury G2. It's powered by a 5.9 litre flat four Lycoming engine that can put out 145 horsepower continuously or 160 horsepower for short bursts. It has a cruising speed of 104 miles an hour and a maximum speed of 115 miles an hour, which puts it on par with a rented van on a motorway. Bringing the fuel tank will give you a flight range of 430 miles, not that far off the WLTP range of the EQS actually, and it even has remote central locking. I've never seen that on an aircraft before. And walking into shot is Dave. He's our pilot and he's going to take us up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. above Rutland and it looks absolutely wonderful today. The only real bumps in the road are little pockets of turbulence but they're very few and far between today. It's very smooth. Yes of course we can feel that the engine vibrating a little bit but what do we expect it is about a foot behind the passenger cabin. As I'm sure you'll be able to hear, it is incredibly loud in here, even with noise cancelling headphones and me yelling into the microphone, but who cares? This is a fabulous way to get around. And I must say as well, Dave, our pilot, is making this look easy. It is not easy to keep a helicopter in the air. If someone can make it look easy, they are exceptionally talented. I also don't want to go back to the ground. I like being in the sky. Back on the ground and back in the EQS and well, <laughs> I'm really enjoying my time behind the wheel of this car. It just floats along the road really. The air suspension does a very good job of keeping intrusion from bumps in the road to a minimum, even in sport mode as well actually. So is the ride on par with a helicopter? In some ways, yes, I would say. Obviously, there's no engine vibration and it is a lot quieter in here, but in some ways, no. It's not really the most conclusive answer I could ever give you, but I just don't think anything can quite beat the ride of an aircraft. The attention to detail inside the cabin is fanatical, but it doesn't just stop at the trim, the stitching and materials and all that sort of stuff. It continues on the digital side of the car. It runs the second generation of MBUX, which made its debut on a car that I said I wouldn't mention again in this video. And there are two display options that you can pick and choose between. The first one is classic, which is very, well, standard MBUX, I guess. But you can also use zero layer, and you can pick and choose between the two by pressing and holding the home button in the center of the screen. 
Zero layer is very much dominated by the navigation with features that the car thinks is most useful to you displayed on the periphery. It will use artificial intelligence to work out what the most relevant one is for you over time. For the most part though, I'm gonna to continue to use the classic layout. One thing I do like is that you get a haptic feedback whenever you tap the screen, so you know that your input has been registered. And as well, this lower portion of the display will always have the air conditioning menu as well as the home and back buttons. You'll probably need to spend a bit of time getting it all set up before you drive. And once you're on the move, that's where using the voice assistant and the two touch sensitive spokes on the steering wheel will be very handy. Of course, it has a dedicated EQ menu for all things charging range and consumption. And if you want, you can set a maximum state of charge. So if you don't want the car to go past say 70%, you can set that on here. And you can also plan pre-entry climate control, which is something that you can do on Mercedes Me as well, whether that's a one-off or a weekly profile. Ahead of the driver, there are lots of different options for what you can have displayed, although my favorite one has to be the assistance graphic, which shows the car and what it can tell about the world around it. And you know, if you indicate the car on screen will, if you flash your lights or if you brake, then the car will show that being done as well. It's just that level of attention to detail that I absolutely love. There are two options for the screens that you can have with EQS. The first one, or the standard one rather, being the twin screen setup that we've got here. But available on AMG Line Premium and above, you can option the hyper screen, which is three displays under one pane of glass that stretches across most of the width of the cabin. I've had a play around with it before. It's very impressive. It looks really good and it sort of functions like a very widescreen MBUX, which well, I suppose it is really. As you know by now, my favorite screen in any car is the windscreen and you can get a head-up display on certain models as well. And if you don't like the look of MBUX, then you can have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto running wired or wirelessly here. To find out, I made a few phone calls and came to Cambridge, which is my favorite city in Cambridgeshire. I also met up with Judah. Now, me and Judah have known each other for quite a while. He's a singer, songwriter, producer, music polymath. Give him an instrument and a task and he will do it. Now, Judah, we originally did this section a few weeks ago. Come back to do it again, so not everything is filmed in one day. I wish I could have got this video done in 24 hours, but here we are. Now, the thing that really stuck with me was when I put you in the car for the first time, and we started playing some stems from your new single and indeed the finished mix. It was the noises and the animations that you were giving off. So tell us, what do you think of the sound system? It's incredible. Honestly, this is probably one of my favorite listening experiences that I've ever had. Like next to recording and mixing the, the single at, at the studio and we recorded it at Metropolis Studio. Nice. This is probably my next favorite listening experience. Yeah, because I think there's a huge difference between listening to music through some tiny, tinny little earphones, yeah. even a good set of overhead headphones. Having the, well, quite literally the sound stage, the speakers all around you, it yeah. just well, it gives it a totally different feeling, doesn't it? And mm. I loved how every single element in the songs, you know, you can hear them. They've all got their place. They're not muddied. They are, well, they're present, yeah. aren't they? Now, if I were to tell you that there is another sound system available. This isn't the top one. You mm. can get the Burmester surround sound system, which has an even higher power output, has more tweeters, more woofers, more speakers. What would you think if I uh, told you that? You shouldn't tell me that because now I need to test it. <laughs> now I need to hear it now. I think, I think we need to give it another go. I will happily give it another go, <laughs> but between now and then, Make sure to check out the music video that we filmed with this car for uh, Cry For Me by Judah. It is linked in the description below. Check it out. It is like nothing I've ever heard before. And that is a huge compliment. I mean, I've given the sound system the drum and bass test, the heavy metal test, the uh, weird dubstep from 2011 <laughs> test. You know, we've tested all of the genres through it. Go and check it out. 
Typically, a saloon is categorized as a car with a three box side profile. So one box for the engine compartment, one box for the passenger cabin, and one box for the boot. Think of it that way. A saloon will generally have four doors, and a door is categorized as a opening which allows you to gain access to the cabin. When you open the boot, the boot lid will open on its own, and the rear glass will stay in place. However, the EQS doesn't really have that pronounced boot section. The roof line just flows gently into what is a very short rear deck and into the ducktail spoiler. So does that make it a coupe? Well, I don't think so, because if you look at a typical coupe, so something like the AMG GT, the CLS, C-Class coupe, Toyota GT86, just have a look. You'll see that there is still a pronounced boot section at the rear. Plus, you'll also see when you open the boot of the EQS, the glass rises up along with the boot lid, which makes it more of a tailgate. So is it a hatchback? Is it a fastback? Well, I would say the rear glass opening like this would put it in a similar category as something like the Audi A7, which Audi say is a sportback, but not the same sort of sportback that the A3 sportback is, which is a five door hatch, which is similar to the A-Class, which you can also have as a four door saloon and is also very closely related to the CLA, which is a four door coupe, but also available as a five door shooting brake, which is an estate. Anyway, with the tailgate open, there is a very generous 610 litres of storage space, but you can fold down the rear seats and remove the parcel shelf to give you a cavernous 1,770 litres of storage space and actually gain access to the cabin through the boot. So, in fact, I would say that this is a five-door. What was the question? Ah yes, it runs on electricity. Maybe that's an important thing to know, but for me so far, I've been thinking of it as a Mercedes first and foremost, a very quiet one, yes, but one that just so happens to be electric. I do mean that as a very big compliment. Now the battery in the floor is a 107.8 kilowatt hour capacity lithium ion unit made up of 12 cells. For the EQS 450 Plus, this sends its power to the rear mounted electric motor and in this trim can deliver a WLTP range of up to 453 miles. It varies depending on the specification. How frequently you need to charge will of course depend on how you drive it, but even driving it like I've been making a video about it, this is my third day with the car and this is the first time I have plugged it in anywhere to top it up. Yesterday I got it down to a 50% charge remaining and it was still showing me just over 200 miles of range left. What that big battery can do is, well, as well as meaning that you can drive a lot further without having to top up, it means that you can drive a lot further without having to start worrying about how much further you can go, I guess. When we get to half a tank full in our petrol or diesel cars, do we immediately start fretting about where we can fill up and how much further we can go? No, I don't think so. But when it does come to topping up the battery, you have a few options. The public charging network is still growing. It's still growing quite quickly. There's over 40,000 plug-in points in the UK at the moment. Rapid charging stations like this are popping up all across the motorway and main A road network. There's a couple of grid serve electric highway chargers over there. There is lots of choice. When you plug the car into a DC rapid charger, it should return a 10 to 80% charge in 31 minutes at a maximum of 200 kilowatts. Officially, I saw it peak at 210 kilowatts. It was well over 200 kilowatts for the first few minutes of the charge. And even when it was at 53% charge, it was accepting energy at about 150 kilowatts. Using AC charging means that a 10 to 100% charge at a home wall box, so seven kilowatt output, will take 15 hours. If you can use a 11 kilowatt socket, then the job will be done in around 10 hours. Now, one thing that you can do to make your use of the public charging network a little bit smoother, let's say, is to make use of one of the charge cars that are available. Mercedes-Benz provide one in the form of Mercedes Me Charge, which gives you a contactless card that is accepted at about 80% of the public charging network at the moment. 
one card, one membership, you get it included for three years with the EQS and just one billing every month for all of the electricity that you use. Unless, of course, you come to an Ionity Rapid Charger in the first 12 months of ownership because you get something called Ionity Unlimited. What is that? Well, it's my favourite thing in the world. Free electricity for free! Free electricity! <laughs> at Ionity for the first 12 months of ownership of your new EQS. That's pretty good, I think. To find out, I've hired a lawyer who is charging me by the quarter hour. So I've got a few questions. Let's get them answered quickly. Do you think the seats are comfortable? The seats are more comfortable than they're not. However, I cannot say beyond all reasonable doubt that they are comfortable. Right, OK. And what is, now that you've had a bit of a ride in it, what's your favourite thing about the car, personally? There are many positives about the car. However, I don't think it would be in the buyer's best interest for me to specify one specific point. All right, that clears that up. Thank you, I guess. So, a big car on a B road. Is this a match made in heaven or is it a match made in hell? Well, I wouldn't take this down the narrowest of country lanes that we have around here, but find a slightly wider road and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. It's an interesting mix, actually. The long wheelbase gives it great stability going round the sort of sweeping bends, but then the all-wheel steering just helps you slice through some of the tighter turns. Really is surprising, actually, how good this thing is through the corners. There's a bit more traction than I expected there to be as well. Definitely a plus. So, of course, I've got the car in sport mode. I've got the uh, energy recovery set to normal, so it will just gently bring my speed down as I'm heading into the next bend. That's a good way to set up the car to take the next corners, actually. One thing to be wary of is it certainly does feel like a two and a half ton car under braking and with there only being one motor at the back it is possible to catch it out so if you're really standing on the brakes I've seen the traction control light come on a few times. I would say it's best just to be gentle with it and again don't throw it into corners just guide it in get the weight to shift and flow through the corner with the car. It feels really well composed on this sort of road being driven like this as well actually, quite surprisingly. There's not too much lean going round the corners. Yes, of course, there's a little bit of float, but that's to be expected with a two and a half ton car on air springs. I must have said this about the C-Class a few videos ago, but if this is the base chassis, then I think the AMGs have a very good starting point to build on. I love making big cars move along like this, especially in this sort of larger luxury car segment. Always puts a smile on my face. You just never see it really, do you? So it's great to know that the car can do it. This little section of road that we're on. Yeah, unlikely home for the EQS, but I think it's doing quite well. There are, of course, a few ways for how you can have your EQS, and the one that we've been living with for this video is the entry-level AMG line version. And yes, I do realize the irony of a £100,000-plus car with five pages of spec being considered entry-level. Anyway, as you go up through the specifications, you, of course, get more toys and goodies added onto the car. There's the choice between the AMG line-based versions and the luxury-based versions, which get different exterior styling and interior features. I do quite like the look of the luxury models. From AMG line premium and above, you can specify the hyperscreen package, which comes as standard on the AMG models. Pricing is on screen now. If you want to find out more about the detailed specification, make sure to have a look at the brochure, which I've put in the description. I would say for now, in the context of large luxurious EVs, that this has to be the yardstick. This is the standard bearer. But if you look very closely at the car, you will see targets all over it. Targets in the shape of roundels, four rings, flying bees, and spirits of ecstasy. 
The competition is coming, the competition will be good, and the competition will need to benchmark against this. And as well, I would say that it's well worth thinking about. It's well worth considering one of these if you are in the market for a large, luxurious car, regardless of fuel type. But why do I say that? To explain what I mean, I've got my hands on an S-Class that also has pop-out door handles. Now this car to me is a truly magnificent technological tour de force and a car that provides such a great sense of relaxation and well, it turns every single drive into an occasion. I love the ride, the refinement, the raised three-pointed star on the nose and the attention to detail in terms of the materials and the digital sides of it. And by the way, this is a petrol plug-in hybrid. Does that matter? I don't think so, not so much as how well it does the rest of the big luxury car thing. When you think about an S-Class, when you think about a 7 Series, A8, Flying Spur, Ghost, Phantom, all of those cars, what's the first thing you think of? Is it that it has a straight six under the bonnet? Is it that it has a six and three quarter litre twin turbocharged V12 under the bonnet? I'm sure you will at some point but not until you've thought about the comfort, the refinement, and the way that it makes the driver and the passenger feel for quite a long time. And therein lies my point. The EQS does the whole luxury limousine thing really well, and perhaps most strangely, I don't think the fact that it's an electric car actually has to be its defining factor. Why do I think that? Well, I think because the real-world range that the huge battery has given me has meant I've been able to do well over 600 miles for this video without actually needing to worry about my remaining range or where I was going to charge. Now, yes, part of that is because there's a Ionity DC rapid charging station relatively local to me, but I think if I were to live with this car for a few months, you know, building up the local knowledge would be one thing, but also being able to use the tools that the car has on offer with the navigation system and Mercedes Me for finding places to charge or just automatically programming that in along your route, I think it would make it a very convenient car to live with. Are there any jobs for the facelift? Yes, I think there always are, although I do think that in this specification, I've barely scratched the surface of what this car can do. I'd love to have a go in a fully loaded one, especially with the driving assistance package plus. I think that would just take motorway driving to the next level. Most of my thoughts about what to do for the facelift were relating to specifications, so I brought this up with my lawyer. So the exclusive luxury lounge package is only available for one model line for the EQS 450 plus. What do you think about that? The exclusive rear lounge package only comes on specific models. I think given the credibility of the manufacturer, they would be best suited to specify the models for this specific market. And would you say similar things about only having one drivetrain available and not having a formatic option apart from the EQS 53? Yes, and I think you should too. There we go. And I agree with absolutely everything that has just been stated. So what do I think about it personally? Well, I think it really is an electric S-Class alternative, and I do think that the S in the name does deserve to be there. And for a car that is so dominated by the tech, you know, all the conversation around the EQS is about the tech, the battery, the range, the hyper screen, all of that sort of stuff. The digital attention to detail is absolutely fantastic. I maintain that. But what I've enjoyed most about this car is driving it. I've enjoyed the seats, the suspension, the steering, the chassis underneath. I've enjoyed the mechanical aspects of this very digitally focused car. What would need to happen for it to be an electric S-Class equivalent, in my opinion? Well, give me one with more power and I'll give you an answer. And there we go. We have lived with an EQS. I've certainly enjoyed it. I hope that you have enjoyed watching the video as well. And if you want to find out more about the rest of the Mercedes-Benz and Smart passenger car range, then make sure to check out the rest of the videos on our channel. And feel free to subscribe to us as well so that you don't miss a thing. To everyone that's helped this video to come together in the way that it has, thank you. Thank you so much. It's certainly been my most ambitious and in parts most ridiculous project that I've taken from script to screen so far, but believe me, there is a lot more that I have to say about this car. The director's cut of the video is well over 40 minutes long, so I think that this model is something that has more to offer and is something that we will come back to. 
Anyway, once again, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again very soon.